Hello, and thank you for joining me for this special episode of Profiles with Paulette Payne. A life well lived, a life well lived is one spent in the service of others. And for Congressman Lewis, service was the hallmark not only of his political career, but his intimate personal relationships. Some who knew him well joined me this evening to talk about the man, servant leader, and friend. But first, if you're joining me for the first time, just a little context about the show. Profiles is a weekly virtual edition of the in-studio taping I did eight years ago. And it's a continuation of a series that I did earlier this year around COVID-19 and systemic racism in America. Both of course can be found on YouTube. The goal of Profiles has always been to create programming that not only informs you, but inspires and empowers you. And I hope this is your experience tonight. As you watch this evening, please feel free to chime in with questions and we'll do our very best to answer. And of course, like and share this page if you find the content valuable. And for tonight's show. On July 17th of 2020, civil rights leader, Congressman John Lewis lost his battle to prostate cancer. But during the span of his life, he won many battles for the sake of liberty and justice. He helped organize the 1963 March on Washington and the 1965 Voting Rights March in Selma, Alabama, which led to landmark legislation in the US that prohibited racial discrimination in voting. He used his life for the, to fight for the inalienable rights and freedoms of black people in America. But to be sure, he was an advocate for all marginalized groups, regardless of race, gender, age, sexual orientation, and any other ism, if you will, that can divide uh, a people. He devoted his life many times, putting it in harm's way, to get into good trouble for the cause of justice. Some of his friends and colleagues are here to remember this gentle giant. But before I introduce them, I'd like to send a special shout out to Tybree Fall. As you may remember, he's the young man who was befriended by Congressman Lewis, 12 years old. Um, and he also, his family actually, invited him to deliver a presentation, uh, Congressman Lewis's favorite poem, Invictus. And he read that at the going home celebration for Congressman Lewis in Atlanta. The two met in Selma, Alabama, and uh, Ty Bree called Congressman Lewis his hero. And when I spoke with him earlier this week, he said Congressman Lewis taught him courage. And as with any 12-year-old, he has a full schedule. Otherwise, today he would have been here joining us for this conversation. So Ty Bree, cheers to a successful football game and, of course, time with your family. So she is the president and CEO of... Larch Communications Incorporated. Let me turn my paper. <laughs> um, and of course, this is an Atlanta-based communications boutique. Diane Larch. Larch. We also have. We it's also have. I'm sorry. It's actually Larch. Larch. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, we also have with us Jared Scott, who is the owner of his grooming, um, his grooming in Washington D.C. And of course, let me, Susan Ross, who is the photo griot. And, and let me just share with you briefly about Susan. Um, <clears throat> she tells stories of the black community through certainly her eye and lens of the camera. And she's got some special information to share with us as it relates to her relationship to Congressman Lewis. So uh, Diane, Jared, Susan, thank you for joining me this evening. Glad to be here. Now, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, of course, you know, you all are better equipped to share with the viewers uh, your experiences with Cong Congressman Lewis um, over the years um, and some just recently. So I'd like to start with you, Diane. Can you tell us your relationship to Congressman Lewis and what that relationship has meant to you over the years? Okay. Um, a friend for over 25 years. Um, he was my husband's close friend. Joe Larche was worked with him in his first campaign when he ran for Congress in 1986. I met him in 1995. Um, we were invited to go to Alabama to an antique shop with, we call him John, John and his wife Lillian. So we took a two hour trip over to 
Alabama with them. He loved antiques. He loved artwork. And so we just had a really um, great friendship. Um, we went to the Congressional Black Caucus with them, and there we met Rosa Parks. He introduced us to Rosa Parks, who was one of his inspirations. And so we've had several opportunities to interact with him over the years. And um, the last time we saw him was his birthday party, his mm -hmm. 80th birthday party at his home. We were a part of that, and that was a special time, very special time. How did learning, of course, about the diagnosis uh, and then, of course, subsequent passing of the congressman impact you, you and your family? Because it sounds like uh, you all shared very intimate uh, experiences with him, certainly his birthday and other um, milestones in his life. What did the news of his passing, how did that impact you? Oh, it was very, very devastating for us. Um, for me, my mother died of pancreatic cancer. So I knew a lot about the disease um, with her. She died within one month of diagnosis. Um, she was diagnosed on Thanksgiving Day and died Christmas Day. So I was very familiar with it. And um, I knew my husband would really, really be devastated because they were like brothers. They mm. talked all the time on the phone. And um, their son, John Miles, calls my husband Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. He's Uncle Joe to John Miles. So we're very close and it was very difficult news to hear um, because we love him. We loved him so much. You know, and, and I can I can ex I can uh, relate to the love. Of course, I didn't have that intimate relationship with him, but the times that I was in his presence, there there's there's this humble um essence about Congressman Lewis. And, and he had no respect of, per of person. He seemed to welcome all people. And when I had the opportunity to meet him on two separate occasions, it, it was as though I was, you know, saying hi to my grandpa. And he just felt like family. And, and I can certainly imagine the, the loss that you all felt. Um, Susan, talk to us about your relationship with Congressman Lewis. Uh, take us from the beginning up until the last time you two had acquaintance? Wow. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was very young. Uh, John was um, a, a member of SNCC and um, growing up we lived uh, in the same uh, compound with uh, Julian Bond's parents. And so the SNCC, all of the, uh, the SNCC kids were all kind of like the big kids to, to those of us growing up at the time. They're all you know, 10, 10, 15 years older than us, but they are, but they were uh, all scaling us with stories of what they had done around the South when they came back to Atlanta to, to relax. Um, but I, I really got to know John more when I, when uh, I was in college and I was an intern to his wife, Lillian. Um, she, she was the, a librarian of the special collections at uh, Atlanta University Trevor Arnett Library. And I had the opportunity to work with her uh, summers while um, while I was in college, and and uh, that was at a time when that whole collection was just being um, microfilmed, microfiche. Actually, it's old technology now. Um, mm -hmm. it, we Bell and Howell Company to prepare it to be to be um, um, microfiche and put on these little tiny uh, cards, and and it was um, because all of that, all of, most of the the works at that time were out of print. That was before. Uh, a lot of the black studies material had been had had started to get reprinted. So all of the Harlem Renaissance novels, all of that, but 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 many many things. And so she was a great uh, archivist, uh, librarian, um, and kind of an architect of John's political career in many ways. You know, she was kind of the driving force behind mm -hmm. that. John was elected to the city, council, uh, and this is a few years later. Uh, uh, when uh, Andrew Young became mayor, uh, and I, um, uh, he represented our district, um, so he was he was our congressman. I mean, our our councilman, and he also uh, I also uh, began working uh, in Andy's administration at that time. So I knew him uh, from city government prior to his run for Congress, and then of course there was a big congressional race, and 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 then our our uh, Congressman and really America's congressman ever since. You know, John, uh, quite 
move through the halls of Congress making things happen. And um, uh, I don't know, um, I mean, rising from from being the boy from Troy to, to going to the, the, the chief uh, deputy whip at the, at the House of Representatives and being responsible for, for getting votes in order. I mean, that, that's a big, that's, that's, a, that's a major, major change. And then he, you know, was able to steer through a lot of uh, legislation that benefited uh, Atlanta and benefited uh, uh, our entire nation. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of people call him a living saint. I'm not going to say he was a saint. He was a moral force um, good in this country. And he was, um, he was the closest thing you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, do you think in our lifetime, mm -hmm. there will be another John Lewis? Do you think that that's possible? Um, yes, I do. I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, people are, are uh, the struggles of black people have gone on for many, many years. And at different times, different people come to leadership. Um, and, you know, some of them are extraordinary individuals who are up to the, ch to the challenge of, of uh, not a uh, kind of selfish political leader that's self-serving and being one that will benefit everyone. So I, I have confidence that another John Lewis type will emerge. I don't know when and I don't know where. I don't know if it'll... It may not be in Atlanta. It may be in in South Carolina. It could be in California, you know. But it's it's um, what when you have public servants that are dedicated to making things right uh, and get into good trouble in order to make things right, then then you will have that. But if, if you know the leadership emerges from the people, and the, the leadership will continue to emerge. Yeah, you know, I appreciate uh, what you said uh, about. Certainly, he he was we he was well loved in Atlanta, but he wasn't just our congressman. He was he he was everyone's congressman in the sense of his his desire to be an advocate for change and for justice and for equity for certainly black people, but all marginalized groups. And to have that that heart for the people is is something that's unmatched in in many uh, political circles these days. Uh, so I, I certainly am, am a fan, if you will, of his heart for service. Uh, Jared, talk to us a little bit about your experiences with Congressman Lewis. And it's, you know, I, as I was sharing with you uh, before the show started, we came across uh, your story and your meeting with him, and I thought it was just very important to have your voice um, added to this conversation. So talk to us a little bit about your experiences with Congressman Lewis. So, um, yeah, so for me, uh, I met the congressman about two years ago. Um, his, his chief of staff, Michael, uh, made an appointment for him at my barbershop at his grooming. Um, and it, what he did was he came in the, pre the day kind of before he wanted uh, John to come in. And he said, I'd like to make an appointment for my boss. And it was interesting because uh, he, he asked to have it uh, before uh, the shop opened. And I thought to myself, I don't take appointments before the shop opens. So I initially said no. Um, and then something in my heart, spirit told me to call back and say, you know what, I'll take the appointment. So I did. Uh, the next morning, um, Michael pulls up, John Lewis gets out of the car. Oh, wow. I was just, <laughs> I can't explain to you what I felt. I think, I didn't know if it was real. It was kind of one of those moments, kind of like when you're sleeping and you're like, am I awake? Am I asleep? Am I awake? It was kind of like one of those. Um, my hands were trembling. Um, you know, um, um, throat gets dry. And, and he walks and he walks in and he's just as relaxed and calm as can be. And he says, hi, I'm, I'm John Lewis. And it's like, I know who you are. <laughs> do you know who you are kind of thing and it's you know it was just he was so peaceful and i and i heard the um other ladies um expressing that as well you know one thing about the barber chair the or the salon chair the beauty chair um you know you can't lie to your barber you can't lie to your 
it, it's a it's a passing of energy when we're, when someone is is an inch or two from you for an extended period of time you you can really see behind what's what's being said you know and um i'm gonna tell you john lewis everything that he portrayed is exactly who he was nothing was different he was a man that was integral he was very centered um he wasn't different in one moment and then it would change in another moment um and I, you know he started to come probably about uh probably once a month for a while um for, for about a year and a half or so um up until actually this january was the, the last time that i shaved his shaved him um and within that time you know he met my family every time he came he asked about my son uh who's four years old um and um who is running behind me um and he got an opportunity to to even meet john sit on his lap take a picture with him um and that's something i i revel and relish you know just because i know what that's going to mean when he understands what that means um but john is just it was just a fantastic experience to be able to learn from him uh for for the period of time that i did the conversations we had uh the things that he would tell me um i'm just trying to help out that's what he would always say i'm just trying to help out so humble and modest and it and it's just like john what do you mean you're you're and, and one thing about john he's a true gentleman he would always pay for his service i i tried every time you're not paying john you've paid enough wouldn't have it he paid every single time so yeah it's just yeah, a little bit of um, it, you know, it's it's sometimes it seems all too real or it seems unreal that someone would be that certainly that centered, um, that selfless, and that um, I, I, sometimes I wonder if he really realized his own greatness. And, and I don't mean to say that in a flighty way, but when when you saw him and he introduced himself as John Lewis, you know, of course you know who you are. Do you know? the magnitude of your existence <laughs> and and for me it's just awe-inspiring that he would be so self um is is there what what conversation stood out the most to you um when he would sit in your chair hmm great question um well um hmm I guess for me, uh, it, 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 a lot of conversations stood out. Um, there was a particular moment where I thought that, uh, I thought to myself, you know, John is bigger than, like you just said, does he realize the magnitude of who he is? Um, and this is a barbershop full of men, right? And so John was sitting there one day and a couple of guys had just come in and they're just like, whoa, John Lewis. and a gentleman was sitting in the waiting chair and out of nowhere, he just starts just, just like baby cry, just, just fully weeping. Hadn't even spoken to John, hadn't introduced himself, but just was able to see there and, and feel the presence. And then everyone in the, everyone started crying. It, it was just being in the, being in the room with him and in his presence. And um, what he said and what he did in that moment for me was just larger than life because it was, what he did was he he pulled the you know the, he pulled the person who was crying he kind of pulled him up and he pulled himself back down to just say we're on the same we're on the same field I'm not doing anything that you can't do I didn't do anything that you can't do um, I'm John and you're Dave or or Fred or Frank and um, you know just just watching him kind of deal with people um, as actual people and not just numbers or or constituents or what have you that was something that I just got an opportunity to see and just stood out to me. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I want to move now to, and I want to come back to this thing, of course, but I want to move now to, um, certainly uh, he was able to experience, witness, and serve with the first Black president uh, of the United States. And we've all seen the pictures. We've all seen the embrace, uh, which to me uh, just really speaks to um, certainly his humility and his appreciation for that recognition. Um, so we also now know uh, that Kamala Harris is, um, she's the nominee for vice president of the United States, first woman and certainly first black woman. Mm -hmm. How do you think that 
How do you think, had Congressman Lewis lived to see uh, that announcement, how do you think that would have uh, impacted him in terms of the history, of course, of Black people in America, the history of Black people in politics, uh, and certainly women, African-American women in politics? How do you think that would have impacted him, knowing that now we could potentially have the first Black female president? Uh, Diane. Um, I know he would be so proud and so happy. Um, this is something that he's always worked for, for African-Americans to ascend in the political arena. And I know that would be something that um, he would love to, to see. Um, Barack Obama was something that made him so proud, was so happy and um, was very close to the Obamas. And um, he just always supportive of women. He was always supportive of all people, whether all races, whether you were black, white, whatever, LGBTQ. John was for the people. And so I think he would he would be proud because we've come a long way and he fought so hard and, you know, was jailed so many times and blood, sweat and tears that he gave. Um, finally, we're at a point where we're seeing things that we didn't know when something like this would happen or if it would ever happen uh, with so much going on in the world. So we're at a point now where it could it could happen. We see something that is possible. And so I know he would be proud. He would be working hard to make sure that all people know to vote. He would be out saying you got to vote each and every one of us that our voices have to be heard and it, the, the voting would be his biggest biggest conversation that everybody needs to vote everyone needs to vote and you know um and sue i want to come to you with that question as well but since we're talking about voting um and and now the push and of course it, it's already happened the um uprooting of um mailboxes in certain areas of the country and this push to quell the vote in minority communities? How, and it's hard to ask this question because it just seems so unfathomable that that is happening in America. But the reality is it is. Um, what does, what in your opinion, and Sue, we can come to you about Kamala and then the answering of this question. Um, how, how far back does that set us, do you think, in terms of the strides that Congressman Lewis made to ensure Black people have the right to vote. How does does that push us back further, or um, is is there an opportunity now for us to, um, you know, say no to this action by the federal government to to try to quell the vote of the black community and certainly the marginalized communities? You know, I, I, voter suppression is nothing the black community. We have been our, uh, when John was was fight was with SNCC fighting to get people registered to vote in Alabama and Mississippi um, when John was, uh, you know, it's not, it's nothing new. In Georgia, when Julian Bond was first elected and was not able to be seated until he was elected three times, they, the Georgia House of Representatives refused to seat him uh, that many times. Um, we have faced voter suppression, of course, and with the, uh, the, the recent uh, election with uh, Stacey Abrams, in which many of us believe the election was in, in fact stolen by the things that were done for suppression to, to limit the number of polling places and to uh, the number of people who were taken off of the voting rolls illegally and, and, and um, incorrectly. Um, so it's nothing new, but it, it's not, I, don't think it, I don't think this new effort is setting us back. It's just making us more determined to do the work to get people out to vote, because in 60 days, there can be change in America. And what has to happen is that people have to get off their rusty dusties and they have to go to the polls or they have to get their absentee ballot and mail it early. Uh, the right. first thing they have to do is check their, re their voter registration status to make sure they have not been taken off the rolls. If they mm -hmm. have, get that corrected. They, they've got about a little less than 30 days to do that in many instances. And then they, then you can, you know, if you're not comfortable going to the polls to vote, then you can request the absentee ballot, but you have to request it now yeah. and before uh, mail it in 
at least 30 days ahead of time or drop it off in a specific uh, we have drop off boxes here in Georgia. I think mo most of the states have those now where you can actually mm -hmm. take your, your ballot, your absentee ballot and and drop it in a, in a drop box right outside one of the polling places, uh, usually at your county, um, the seat, your county government seat. Uh, mm -hmm. Those will be located. And so um, so those are those are the things that can be happened. There, there's early voting. Uh, they're, you know, they, they've cut down early voting in Georgia. They cut down. We, we, we were very successful with uh, taking souls to the polls on Sunday. So they've shut down the number of Sundays that we can that we can actually vote in early voting. But we will vote. And I think people are determined that we are not yeah. letting Lewis die in vain, that we are going to get out there. We're going to get into trouble. We are going to vote. We're going to make sure that our voices are heard in this election. So, mm -hmm. uh, no a setback it's it's just another part of the struggle another right. just a part of the struggle we we know we have to overcome great things we had tremendous turnout when when obama was elected many of us met barack obama for the first time um at john lewis's it must have been his uh, 65th birthday mm -hmm. um um obama had just been elected to the senate and uh he came down and was the keynote speaker for john's birthday party that year it was incredible, incredible, incredible birthday party with uh, John Lewis, Coretta Scott King, Ethel Kennedy, uh, Obama, Harry Belafonte. I mean, it was it was just a star-studded affair, and um, and uh, so his relationship with Obama goes back years and years and years. Um, and in fact, we had some fun when Obama was running for Senate. We had some fundraisers for him here in Atlanta uh, mm -hmm. when he was get, just getting started. But the, the, the key thing is, is that all of these things are in John Lewis's tradition of, um, of making things happen, of getting, getting into good trouble, getting mm -hmm. into trouble. And, we will, and, and so we will get out and vote. I think John would have been just really excited about uh, mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. You know, he had the opportunity to serve with her in Congress, uh, which Senate from California. Um, he um, is... Uh, always been supportive of women in politics. Uh, we, we um, you know, feel that it, it just is, is really about empowering all communities to get involved. And mm -hmm. so, and, and, but most of all, he's concerned about getting Democrats elected and changing this, changing what's happening in Washington. So we mm -hmm. want to, um, so he would be most, um, uh, you know, I think that 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 her selection is going to energize young people and women in in the black in the black and other minority communities. Uh, the South Asian community has not been represented in politics on national level. Uh, this is this is going to be uh, an incredible together of many communities. And so I see I see her very much in John Lewis's tradition of coming mm -hmm. to uh, to make some and being willing to be. Uh, uh, you know, very outspoken in making this happen. I think, I think, as as this campaign progresses, I think you're going to see her making stronger and stronger statements to uh, move uh, their ticket forward. And that's mm -hmm. all. In Thank you for that, Sue. Um, Jared, so in in all barbershops, many barbershops around the country, um, particularly those in the African American community. Men come together and, and they share stories, they share experiences, young and old. Um, what has been some of the conversations around, you know, the political atmosphere uh, in America right now and in terms of voting, in terms of the first black female uh, vice presidential uh, candidate? What, what's what been some of that conversation uh, that you've heard and, and participated in? But Jared, I think you may need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, people people are just antsy to get um, to the other side. Um, and so, you know, I, I deal with a, a group of men who are, um, you know, pretty accomplished men. So a lot of them have um, spheres of influence and each each one of them are doing as much as they can to influence others to go and vote. Um, it, it's, you know, people are really connected to this moment. Um, 
younger people, middle-aged people, older people, people are very, very connected to this moment because like you said, uh, or like it was said in 60 days or so, um, all of this can change. Um, when it comes to Kamala Harris, I think that um, Congressman would be inspired by, by her. Um, as, much as, as much as inspirational as he is, he, he still gathered inspiration and he still felt like he had to keep fighting. Like there, it wasn't done, you know? And that was one of the things, you know, he even told me, you know, I, I had to, I told him, I, I asked him, I said, what do I do? You know, I'm, I'm talking to the greats right now. I'm here on Capitol Hill as a black owned businessman because of what you did. You know, what you did is the reason that I'm here and you're in my chair so like the past, the present, and the future was all in this moment. And I'm just like overwhelmed. And what he said to me was just as simple as you can say it is you got to keep fighting. And it was, well, tell me more. I want to hear more. But no, it was that simple. You know, uh, you, you got to keep fighting. And I think he'd be inspired by Kamala, um, especially the representation from uh, the South, South Asian, Indian, um, uh, Black, uh, Caribbean, um, you know, uh, female married to a, a Caucasian man. And, you know, that's the whole spectrum, you know? And, and when we talk about America, she's that representation of our future um, and even you know, and her children, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think this is the moment where, you know, we can really um, galvanize one another and, uh, and, and make change. Diane, what was some of the conversations you all would have in terms of um, certainly politics, but voting and, and uh, voter registration and, and certainly um, his impressions of President Obama? And can you talk to us a little bit about some of those exchanges? I, I really want this conversation, as it ha has already been, uh, to be an insight into the heart, into the life, and into the service of Congressman Lewis. So certainly uh, any any stories I'd love to glean from you all. So the viewers can, uh, those who weren't as familiar with Congressman Lewis, uh, can glean a little bit more from his life and his experiences, and then of course his service. Oh, sure. Um, I'm, I'm laughing now because Sue mentioned something and she mentioned how Lillian Lewis had a lot to do with shaping Congressman Lewis and things that he he did. And I, my husband and Lillian were very close and she, he was sort of her sounding board. She would call and they would talk about what's going on and with Congressman Lewis and what's going on in politics in general. And I would laugh because it could be midnight. And, you know, my wife wondering, okay, who's my husband talking to at midnight? And they're just laughing and cackling. And I would come, I was like, who are you talking to, Joe? It's Lillian. <laughs> so he and Lillian are talking about the latest, you know, going on with politics and who should win this race and who this race. But so I, she had a lot of influence over him. And I just wanted to mention that. I just thought about that. And um, I think I want to mention that. Um, Nakima Williams is running for his seat in our District 5. I'm, I'm, a, I'm in District 5. It's my district, and she's my current um, senator. And uh, I am actually co-chair of women for Nakima Williams. And I, I think that she and Congressman Lewis had a really great relationship. And um, I think he would be, be proud um, of her and the progress she has made. And she got locked up one time and, you know, felt sort of what he had gone through of being arrested for standing up for we, what we believe. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I remember about him is always speak out for what you believe in, that he was very, that was very important to him. And a couple of um, opportunities that I had to share him with the community, um, he was the spokesman for my Real Men Cook for Charity Atlanta every Father's Day. And he would come and I would say, okay, John, you have to do the kickoff. Give, give the men, the fathers, the charge. And he would pull me aside. Okay, Diane, what you want me to say? And I'm like, whatever you feel that you want to say that will motivate these men. And that meant a lot to him because they were fathers, like he was a father himself. And he came for probably six years, starting in 2002. And he served barbecue chicken. Everyone knows the story of how he used to talk to the chickens in Troy, Alabama. He will, you know, he was gonna pre be a preacher at one time. So he would 
the chickens were his audience. That was his congregation. So he, he always had this thing about chickens. And um, so he served barbecue chicken. And the thing is, the, his line would always be the longest. And his line would be, um, it would take a long time for everybody to get through because he would talk to everyone. And they had his undivided attention. And we'd have to pull him away. Okay, you know, time's up, but you know, we gotta move the line. But he would not, you know, push them. He would talk to them. And he was that way. Um, I handled the public relations for his 75th birthday party five years ago. And we were out and it was uh, Deidre Dukes. We were out and she was doing an interview with him and people would just walk up to him, just literally walk up to him. And he would stop and would talk to them and share with them and hear what their concerns were and take pictures with them. So he was very gracious with his time. But I think he, you know, he's always been proud of the successes of other people. Like some years he couldn't come to be with us for Real Men Cook or Family Food Fest because he would be traveling. Everybody wanted him to speak at their college graduation. You know, he was just in demand. And then he would go and travel for other, those running for Congress. You know, he would be all over the country. You know, I call his assistant said, where, you know, where's he going to be? Can he come? Well, he's going to go and campaign for somebody over here in Arkansas. So he gave a lot of his time to not only see the success of himself, but of for others. And he supported the Obamas. He supported, you know, everybody in office and just the people around him. He was just a good person who supported everyone, who whomever you were. And you didn't have to be famous. You didn't have to have a title. He supported all people at all times. He was always John. He was the same person. Of course, he was Congressman Lewis, but he was also just a humble, down the earth person. And, you know, you summed it up pretty well in terms of uh, the word that you used to describe him, gracious. And that's what he was. He was he was gracious. Um, I remember when I met him, I met him the first time uh, on a job service project. And, you know, I thought this was, you know, of course I knew who John Lewis was, but I didn't really know the man. Um, and I thought, oh, he's just here for a political opportunity, you know, photo op. Congressman Lewis took off his coat he took off his tie and he put on the t-shirt for the, the the organization and he got to work. And I was just so moved and so impressed by his actions. And, and it wasn't for gain. It was for the, for, for the opportunity to serve the community. Um, mm -hmm. And afterwards we all went back, you know, had refreshments and things. And I had a chance to, to talk to him, you know, just basically I was in awe, like you were, Jared, um, but I had a chance to just talk to him. Nothing, you know, in depth, nothing life changing or world changing, but it was life changing because again, he, he was just so gracious with his time. And then the second time I saw him at the mall. So uh, if you live in Atlanta, it's, it was nothing as mm -hmm. some of you who are watching can attest. And certainly uh, my guests, it was nothing to run into him at the at the mall or at the grocery store. And he was always, Jared, like you said, the same person every time. Uh, we have joining with us uh, Dr. Kimberly Ellis. And I must say, one of our um, guests tonight, Kelly Jackson, she had a family emergency and certainly sends her regrets. But I want you to know who she is. She uh, is the Voter Education Press Secretary and the Office of the Georgia Secretary of State. So, um, of course, she would have lent her voice, uh, certainly as a friend of Congressman Lewis, but as a colleague as well. But we have Dr. Kimberly Ellis joining us. Dr. Ellis, uh, I can't see because I don't have my glasses on and the box is a little smaller now. So if you could wave to us. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking this last minute request. We've been talking about Congressman Lewis. Of course, we've been talking about um, uh, the, the, the move to uh, suppress the Black vote and certainly in marginalized communities. Uh, I understand that you are very well versed in this area of voting and uh, certainly voter registration. Can you talk to us a little bit about, of course, we know the importance of voting, but for those who are watching who are on the fence. Can you talk to us about why it's important, certainly to let your voice be heard, but 
voting your conscience and, and gauging the temperature of, of the political climate and, and certainly lending your voice to change. Sure, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Even if it is at the last minute, it's a pleasure to join all of you. Um, and it's interesting because I was telling Paulette that I uh, had to go and deliver some food because I help with uh, the food bank. You know, we just engage in mutual aid. I'm a volunteer, but I had promised someone uh, some food. And so I said, you know, I'm going to be a little late, but I'll be there. Um, when I was listening to Diana, um, I was pleased because I was just on a call on how to fight against voter suppression with Senator, uh, with, yeah, with, um, I'm sorry, not Senator yet, I guess, or it is Senator. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so with uh, yeah. Senator Hema Williams and, um, and also Jennifer Lawson from um, the Democracy Alliance. And so, you know, we talked a lot about the legacy, the legacy of John Lewis, which is, which, which is what he would say is more important than his person. You know, um, all I can think about is, like voting and voter suppression in this era of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Because, you know, for John Lewis to have been a member and, a, and a, certainly a leading member, but he was a member of a group, you know, and I think that he always wanted us to remember that about him and that he was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, just imagine if we just focused on that name alone while we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And these days, you hear a lot of people, um, especially on the far right, and especially those who are trying to suppress the Black vote in particular, the Black and Brown vote in particular, and any conscientious person's vote, actually, for this election. And you hear them saying, those aren't peaceful protests. That's not peaceful protests, you see? And so I think about the ways in which persons like John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Stokely Carmichael, you know, Kwame Ture, um, all of their discussions and their struggles in SNCC and how important it was that they presented themselves as people who were very serious about really pushing America to make it this more perfect union. Like we've been hearing that from Kamala Harris, we've been hearing that from Joe Biden, we heard it from President Obama, but now we're in like a slightly different era because we really do have the worst president in the history of the United States. And and who's actually, you know, literally, it's one thing to, to, to criticize a president and say, you know, you took us to war and we didn't like that, you know, or, uh, you know, we, we protest against the Vietnam War. But to actually have someone who would try to, one, use the American military the military, you know, against uh, against her own citizens, is even a little bit more. It's a little different, right, than what John Lewis faced because they were fighting local police departments, and it became like states' rights versus federal rights. So at least they had conversations on a federal level where they could they could say, "This is an emergency, and we need to call you in, and we need you to help protect us." You know, we see little Ruby, you know, surrounded by all the soldiers and you know all the officers. That was like a federal protection over local indignation. You know, uh, in terms of ending Jim Crow, we have something even worse now because our actual president is sending in or trying to send in the troops and then generating citizen white militia that he hopes will be deputized by local police departments to brutalize people who were just like John Lewis. So this is a very precarious situation. It's a violent situation. It's, it, it's, a, it's a violent situation on a number of different levels. Like there's the obvious violence where two people get killed in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and four people get shot. And uh, you know, you've got the shootings in Portland and uh, what is it? Most Rochester, most recently, you have that level of violence, which is very real and very dangerous. And then you have the level of violence where you are actively engaged in voter suppression, and and you decide to appoint a postmaster general who decides that he needs to revamp the organization of the post office right as we lead up to the election. <laughs> We know that that's voter suppression. He's like, oh, well, I'm just trying to clean up. You know, I'm just, don't mind me. I'm just reorganizing, <laughs> you know. So the games, the the, the blatant, um, it's more than hypocrisy, hypocrisy. It's just an outright bravado. It's a, it's a, it's another level 
of a display of white supremacy that I think even John Lewis, I mean, he he got it. You know, he, he literally fought to his dying day, right? To say, get this man out of office. You know, I'll do whatever, I'll hang on. He, he may have hung on even longer than, than you know, he, he really had time for just to make sure he could sign whatever he could sign. So I, you know, I can't help but to think now about like just the legacy of John Lewis and what he gave us in, in the concert with Nick. Uh, and as a member of that group, because that that collective identity is extremely important for us. Um, and I can't help but to also think about the loss of Chadwick Boseman, you know, in this time period, just the levels of black excellence that we have. Um, we owe it. We owe it to Chad Bozeman. We owe it to John Lewis. We owe it to Kwame Ture. We owe it to Martin Luther King Jr. We owe it to Diane Nash. We owe it to Fannie Lou Hamer to not just vote, we can't even just vote. We have to actually take at least 10 people with us. And we also need to vote for particularly the black and brown people that have passed away during COVID. You know, it's a serious thing. Like we we tag, we're it, we're it, and this is it. And this is a real battle. See, I live in Pennsylvania. So we often talk about Pennsylvania being a battleground state. We are at battle. We lost and I put lost in quotes because we know that they were cheating, but we lost to Trump by only 70,000 votes um, in 2016. And I just kind of want to also remind people, especially as we talk about this era of the Black Lives Matter movement and the legacy of John Lewis and the importance of voting and how to vote, fight back against voter suppression, that, you know, Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's uh mother, she had just run for, you know, county commissioner in Florida. She lost by 331 votes. That is, that's a party. That's like, you know, a family reunion. That's a big cookout. That's, we, you know, we need to do better and that we need to take it way more seriously than we are. Take it as seriously as these masks. Um, So one of the things that uh, both Senator Nakima Williams and Jennifer Lawson really emphasized was that this is about an election period. This is not about election day. Right. We need to be working right now. This is the election period. So take in, case in point, although we, we definitely have different rules across various states, early voting has already begun in certain states. And I, I think by Monday, it's starting in Pennsylvania. So we need to be taking people, we need to be strolling to the Board of Elections we need to be taking our mail-in ballots because some people want to request a mail-in ballot and then they want to physically hand it in because they're nervous about you know, the mail system. Um, we need to be very proactive. We actually cannot afford to wait until November 3rd. This is not about election day. This is about an election period. So let's take this entire period to honor our ancestors and to honor the work that they did individually and collectively so that we can actually push towards this more perfect union and also engage in harm reduction and get this dic- this wannabe dictator out of office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. I appreciate those words. Um, and, and as you were talking, uh, I thought about, you know, action verbs, action words, and voting is certainly a verb. It's, it's, it's researching your candidates on the local level. Um, seeing if they align to your moral code and the needs of your community, and certainly taking your community with you uh, so that we all, all of our voices can be heard. Um, I want to talk really quickly because we're coming to a close um, around the Black Lives Matter movement. Just today, it was announced that um, Donald Trump is ceasing funding for critical race theory, um, the teaching of that in federal agencies. So uh, in terms of white supremacy and and America being founded under racist uh, ideologies and actions and now deeming Black Lives Matter a threat to to American safety, if you will. Um, What what are your thoughts? And and again, we have to be uh, brief in in this, but what are your thoughts uh, around this move and what do you think Congressman Lewis would be doing now to fight that? Uh, Sue, let's hear from you. Well, I think um, I think John would be very outspoken about this. Uh, I think that uh, we can count on the current occupant of the White House to do whatever he can to uh, try to destroy our 
is to make a difference in this country in 60 days. And um, I'm going to do something more outrageous every single day. And so we just we, we just need to be vigilant. We need to know that he is going to lie, going to take actions that weaken uh, uh, critical areas in our government. But we, we also need to be resolute that in John's uh, footsteps, we can stand and we can make a change. Right. And so we do have to get everyone to the polls, all souls to the polls. We have to, we have, we have to vote like we have never voted before in this election. It is, it is critical that, that we vote, all, our whole community, our whole nation. Uh, one, of the, one of the key differences, I think, in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'm one that John himself brought up in, in his, in his uh, last article, was that this movement has galvanized many communities. It's not just Black people that are galvanized by Black Lives Matter. But if you will see that there are white people and brown people and, and yellow people and, and, and uh, all kinds of communities that are out there in the streets because people matter. You know, right. we, we, we know that black lives have been disrespected and that it's important for us to, uh, to uh, gain respect within our community and to, and to uh, uh, you know, deal with police brutality and, and all of these issues. But, but we have to deal with it by changing the top first. And, and any other differences we have within our community, we've got a mission and we've got two months to do it. Two months. The time is the time is drawing to a close. Um, and certainly on that note, we'll have to close tonight's conversation. But uh, I, I want to thank you each for taking the time to share your memories of Congressman Lewis, the importance of voting, the importance of bringing your community with you to cast your vote. Uh, because again, this this is a critical time in American history, and November third can change the trajectory if we all cast our votes and allow our voices to be heard. And I, I want to impress upon the viewers, uh, because we have people from all walks of life watching, uh, this election is critical in the, in the sustainability of the American America, to the sustainability of America, to the equity of its people, its black and brown people, but to all people. Um, systemic racism is real. Uh, go back into the history books. Go back to the founding of this country. Systemic racism is, is alive and well. Uh, police brutality is alive and well in the Black community. And there, you know, I was in conversation with uh, someone recently that white people get cl killed and shot too. That might be true, but those individuals walk away with their lives. Black people do not walk away with their lives. Uh, unarmed Black people. Um, and that's the fight, that's the push, that's, that's part of the systemic racism that has plagued this country for, for, since its founding. Um, and certainly since uh, black people were brought here as enslaved Africans. Uh, so when we talk about voting, when we talk so adamantly about this race, it's because we want equity and justice, certainly for black people, but for all marginalized communities. And right now that's not happening. And so I thank my guests. Thank you each for taking the time to come and share your memories about Congressman Lewis again, and, and certainly about the importance of voting uh, on November 3rd. November 3rd, get to the polls. All polls to the souls, certainly. Please do that. Uh, for your children, for your children's children, it's that important. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us tonight on Profiles, the special edition as we remember the legacy of Congressman John Lewis. I hope he's pleased. I hope he's pleased with tonight's conversation. And certainly come back next Saturday, same time, same location. We'll be talking with uh, those living with alopecia or retina. And of course, this is National Alopecia or Retina Month, Awareness Month. And I'll be speaking with